is my great pleasure and privilege to begin uh, the, this program for the presentation of the Hackett Award, the Academy's highest honor. And we're going to begin with a video introduction to the award and the formal announcement of this year's recipient. The Eleanor and Thomas P. Hackett Memorial Award is inspired by the life and career of Dr. Tom Hackett, who helped establish the Academy during its formative years. He led CL psychiatrists in firmly identifying the field as being in the heart of medicine. There's a reason why the Hackett Award is the most preeminent award that the organization offers because of Tom's um, great leadership in this. And he did it at a time when, again, as I say, there were forces in the field that were really rushing to demedicalize psychiatry in a way that would have been very, very dangerous and very bad for both training and clinical care. Tom would come and he'd just be around. And you could, if you had a problem or a unique issue, he would always listen to you and come up with some interesting answers. He was always humble. Tom, during his lifetime and career, changed the lives of so many psychiatrists, especially CL psychiatrists, because he practiced the principle of being a physician first and a psychiatrist second. His wife, Ellie, was a fixture at Academy meetings and developed the ways we honor Academy members for their service. The Hackett Award is therefore the Academy's highest honor, given to the individual whose concern for others, warmth, humor, and commitment to excellence best recalls Tom's and Ellie's vibrant spirits, whose gifts as a teacher, particularly at the bedside and in the outpatient clinic, are best characterized as inspiring whose intellectual curiosity has generated innovative research at the interface of psychiatry and medicine, whose leadership across a broad range of contributions has advanced both the field of consultation liaison psychiatry and the impact of the academy. This year's award is given to another one of our profession's most talented and accomplished members. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Phil Muskin. And now I'd like to ask Dr. Anna Dickerman, Kitty Garza, and Sarah Nash to come and formally introduce Dr. Muskin to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Anna Dickerman. I run the CL service at Weill Cornell in New York. And I was fortunate enough to do my fellowship at Columbia which is how I first got to know and work with Phil. On behalf of myself, Kitty Garza, and Sarah Nash, it is our absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Philip Muskin as the recipient of the 2019 Eleanor and Thomas P. Hackett Award. For those of you who've been fortunate enough to attend one of Phil's amazing talks on how to be an effective speaker, you may recall that one of his main points is to have a conversation with your audience about your passion for the topic. And when it comes to talking about Phil, that won't be hard. But we're not here to tell you about Phil's remarkable accomplishments in education, scholarship, as a critical advocate and pioneer in the field of CL psychiatry, you can read about all that stuff on the ACLP website. What we want to tell you about today is what makes Phil so special to us. For the three of us, Phil is much more than a mentor, a boss, a friend. He is our academic father. He's attended our weddings, celebrated the births of our children. Now you can see here, uh, this is uh, the bris of my son two years ago, and you can see Phil photobombing there in the background. 
Um, but, but you'll notice that he's right up there with my sister, my grandfather, my whole family. Phil has supported our careers as women psychiatrists. For over 30 years, he developed and grew the Columbia CL division, and he's always had an open door or a piece of home-baked cake for his faculty and trainees. In fact, one of the amazing things about Phil is that he's not just a psychiatric scholar, but also a culinary one. And as any good parent should, he always knows where to get the best meals in town, no matter where you are. And whether over cake in the Columbia conference room or ribs at the annual meeting, Phil is generous with his time, guidance, and advice. So in addition to being something of a gourmand, as Anna has mentioned, as you can see here, Phil is also a talented horticulturist. He has been patiently tending to these basil plants in his office um, that are now pretty enormous, not dissimilar to the ways in which he's tended to, cultivated, and nurtured the careers of so many trainees and early career psychiatrists. Um, and here's a picture of him sharing his basil and tomatoes with us over lunch. As a truly devoted CL father, Phil is always interested in sharing the wealth when it comes to opportunities for scholarship, as evidenced by the scores of trainees and junior psychiatrists, all of us included, in co-authoring and co-editing papers and book chapters. He's also insisted, for better or worse, on sharing opportunities for media exposure, as you can see in this throwback photo of Anna and Phil um, at a podcast. And here with me, discussing embedded psychiatry in the Wall Street Journal, Phil is incredibly generous, not only with his knowledge and his time, um, you know, a, well, a very little known fact is that during his tenure, decades long tenure as chief of our division, he took call every weekend. Um, the PGY4 could call him at any time with any problem, whether he was at a ball game or over brunch um, to discuss any cases that uh, they had questions about. But he's also been very generous with his personal resources. For example, um, taking the time to shuttle several members of our service to and from work when public transportation was shut down in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, and also kindly sharing the name of his custom suit maker, inadvertently spawning uh, my husband's now full-on obsession, uh, which I don't thank you for. And he has also shared with us his musical talents, as evidenced by his presence at the inaugural annual Columbia CL Karaoke Extravaganza. And finally, on a more personal note, when I had my first child and my original childcare arrangement fell through, Phil immediately sent over the person he thought would be best qualified to care for my newborn, the very nanny who helped to raise his own son, Matthew, from the time Phil came home with him from the hospital approximately 30 years prior. Some mentors will give you the shirt off your back, but how many people can really say their mentor gave them the nanny out of their home? None of this is surprising when it comes to Phil. His devotion is unparalleled when it comes to his colleagues, friends, and family. His wife, Marlene, his son, Matthew, and daughter-in-law, Catherine, and most especially, his granddaughter, Cece. Phil is a fiercely loyal and protective mentor and boss. When he was chief of the service, on the first day of every new resident rotation, Phil made clear to the trainees something his faculty knew very well. He had your back, no matter what. And in what better way can residents and fellows and faculty learn and grow than by knowing they had the unconditional support of their leader. Phil has always made it easy to learn. In part, this is because he knows everything. <laughs> but more than that, it is because he's an incomparable teacher. I judged my own development as a CL psychiatrist based upon my interactions with Phil. As a resident, I would call him for supervision with every consult and ask, Phil, what would you do? As a fellow, I would begin to think, what would Phil do, before going to him and asking him what he would do. Through my years as an early career psychiatrist, I would ponder what Phil would do, do it, and then go ask him if I did the right thing. And finally, one day, after years of conversation and advice and mentorship, I realized I had made it because I had somehow developed my own internalized Phil. 
With all these things in mind, it is no surprise that Phil has won the prestigious Hackett Award. This is an award that was long deserved, and his nomination could have come from so many different people, from so many different places, and at so many different times. But ultimately, this year is Phil's year, and the nomination had to come from us, his Columbia CL family. The reason is simple. He has our backs, and we love you. Thank you all. I cannot express what an honor this is for me. I'm going to take you over the next four and a half hours <laughs> through the story of my life. And I've put this play on words because we talk about collaborative care, that the story of my life has been one of care and collaboration. Uh, I have no exact disclosures, though I will be showing you covers of books that I've written, for which I have received honoraria, for which the Foundation has received donations. So it's worked out very well. This is in honor of my sister Elise, who sadly passed away from breast cancer a few years ago. Uh, I called her my older sister, even though she's seven years younger than me. Uh, she was wise in many ways beyond her years. And as some of you may know, she eventually became the COO of the anxiety, what was called the Anxiety Disorders Association, and then the Anxiety and Depressive Disorders Association. And over time, she came to know absolutely everybody I knew. And she would call, and I won't mention any names, and she would say, well, what do you think of this person? Because he's an a-hole. And I said, yes, but he's a brilliant a-hole, and that's just the way it is. So she knew all of my collaborators, all of my mentors, uh, which was also an awful lot of fun. And when a per certain person got shot in the face by a shotgun at a New York institution, I regretted that she had passed away because he didn't die. And we would have said, you only can kill him with a silver bullet. And we would have laughed quite a bit. So this is me. And not surprisingly, as you see, I am 99.7% Ashkenazi Jewish. And that comes as no surprise. And as you can see, I look like I'm 99% Ashkenazi Jewish at a time when I had much more hair and it was much darker. And I know this is difficult to see, but this is the 1940 census. And in, in yellow is my grandfather, Morris, my grandmother, Elise, who died three weeks after I was born, for whom my sister was named, and my aunt, Irene, uh, who married an Italian guy, took on the name Petroselli, and spent the next several decades singing opera in Italy, uh, my aunt Paula, and my father. Except in my family, my father was always the eldest, because it didn't look good for the opera singer to be the oldest of the three. And they lived in that same apartment from about 1935 until my aunt passed away, I think, in around 2000. Now, I know I'm a royal pain in the ass, but it turns out I get it honestly. Richard III and I, another royal pain in the ass, share an ancestor. And I've told my wife for many years that I know I'm British royalty. <laughs> and like... Like Moses, they put me in a little basket and just sent me across the pond to end up in New York, and I can now prove it genetically. This is my mother on her wedding day, and that's my grandfather. Uh, I found this, this actual photograph. I, I just scanned it in, and uh, I'm pretty sure it's my, my mother on her wedding day. You can see that the, uh, the, the music behind is reversed, and that's because my father must have made a print of this and done it incorrectly. And so, a year after they were married, I was born, and I'm vintage 1948. And as people know, I appreciate a good glass of wine, a good glass of scotch, a good glass of bourbon, a nice vodka, <laughs> maybe a sauterne. I don't like aquavit. 
This is the earliest pictures I have of myself. Again, as I mentioned, my father was a photographer. So on the top is me quite, quite young. And you can see as I develop into the you know, first year or year and a half. My father was living in Salt Lake City. He was in a master's program for uh, uh, physical rehabilitation and psychological rehabilitation. And my mother and I went there. Unfortunately, I happened to contract polio in New York at that time during the polio epidemic. This is not me. Uh, but I spent the next three and a half months in a hospital and noticed years later that this is how nurses dressed back then. That when I saw nurses and nurses in traditional garb, which is really not true anymore, particularly hats, it had a weird effect on me. And the other thing that I noticed about myself, and you notice I almost never wear shorts, is whenever I see my legs, I always say, what the heck happened to my leg? When did that happen? And I have an atrophied left leg. And it to this day surprises me when I see that I have an atrophied left leg. And what I didn't know at the time, and we'll come back to, that there was such a thing as post-polio syndrome, because back then, you either made it or you didn't. I was quite lucky I didn't have the, uh, the pulmonary form of uh, polio. But no one knew that this was actually a lifelong illness, which I'll come back to in a little bit. This is me, much cuter with my dog, Pete, named for Mark S. Peterson, who was the elder of the Mormon church. We were living in Salt Lake, as I mentioned, at the time. And just after that, he was run over by a car. But he wasn't killed. He had a, a leg, and he was a three-legged dog. And my parents would tell me that I refused to take the hot pack treatments unless he and, and, and I took my hot pack treatments together to reverse the, the tightness that was in my legs. He was my lifelong friend. And I have to say, for a transitional object, he was the best you could possibly have. He was warm and furry, and everywhere I went, he went. And we were lifelong companions until he passed away when I was in college. This is the saddest slide in, in my journey. So this is me, I'm quite an angel. And the dark figure is my father, and remarkably looks so much like my father, you'll see him later on. For those of you who know the Rorschach, there is a card, it's the very black card, kind of looks like a black butterfly, it is called the father card. And this is the father card. And so I'll tell you something that very few people know. I grew up in a house of incredibly horrible abuse, triple, triple abuse. My mother was physically, sexually, and emotionally abused by my father and I was physically and emotionally abused by my father. I made two promises to myself when I was a child. I would never cry because that meant I gave in, and it took two analyses for me to be able to cry. And the second promise I made to myself is I would never yell at my child ever. I have a voice that has been trained, for those of you who do martial arts, to kill and I never raised my voice in my home ever. And I learned the best way to be a good parent was to do exactly the reverse of what my parents did. At age 11, I had a dream. And this is from Interpretation of Dreams, the book that I support at the APA Mel Shapson Library. And in this dream, I was called to do neurosurgery. Now, many of you will not know who Ben Casey is, but Ben Casey was a famous television neurosurgeon. And I was called to do surgery, and in thinking about it in the dream, this was an emergency and I would save this person's life. And I woke up and said, I'm going to be a neurosurgeon. And then I said, no way. I love to use my hands, I, I carve things all the time, mostly my fingers and realized that this was not for me, and said, quite literally, what's the next best thing after a neurosurgeon? And that was psychiatrist. And so at age 11, I decided to become a psychiatrist. I told my mother, which was a mistake, because for the rest of her life, whenever I strayed from being a doctor, she would say, be a doctor first, and then you can do anything else you want. And so my first collaborator was Sigmund Freud. He did not know at the time that we were collaborating. And many of my collaborators have not known that we were collaborating. Because in my home, every book was available. Nothing was hidden, nothing was closed. 
Everything was there, and we had the collected works. And the first book I read was a, a little monograph out of the collected works called The Problem of Anxiety. And in The Problem of Anxiety, Freud talks about a variety of different things, including writer's block. And he talks about the pen being a phallic object and the ink coming out. And I said, this is absurd. But on the other hand, it makes a lot of sense. And I think this is something I might want to do. And so this is when I'm 11, and this is us in the intellectually gifted class. And that, in the old days, was called SP, depending on where you lived. And we were segmented off from the rest of the school. And we were in the same group, and we tracked together for actually many years. There I am on the, uh, I guess, your lower left. And these, these were my folk. I knew them since the third grade. And I still know them. And so this is the, the few of us that remain. And the person in the middle was the teacher we had, Mrs. Beverly Greenberg. And we had her for two years. Why? because they could not find a teacher adequate enough to teach us. So we had her for two years. And when we got together, this is a few years ago, the person on the, on the, the, the lowest portion with the red hair is an elected judge in New York. She has gotten me out of many juries because I mentioned that I know her, and people go, oh, you know Marsha? And I'm off the jury. <laughs> so I walk into Marsha's home, and uh, Mrs. Greenberg walks up to me and says, hi, Phil, and shakes my hand. And I say, Mrs. Greenberg, not being able to call her Beverly, how could you recognize me? And she said, you look exactly the same. <laughs> and I went on to collaborate. And these are important collaborators for me. Freud, Einstein, Salk, amazing. They put them all on one cover for me. Uh, Keynes and, and, and um, I'm blocking on her name, but it'll come to me. You can see uh, Rachel Carson. Because I've had a concern about the environment my whole life. I can't add or subtract. So, you know, someone who is an expert in economics has always amazed me. But during this time of my life, I came to an important decision about the universe and God, which was they must be the same. And the idea of the singularity, the idea that the universe did not exist before it existed, still drives me crazy, by the way. But I came to the understanding that must be God, and that worked for me just fine, that essentially, not if God was one of us, but we all are God, because we're all in the universe, and that's what God became. And it actually has served me very well. It doesn't work so good when you talk to the rabbi, but it, it's served me quite well in time. And so this is where I grew up. We called it Flatbush. And for those of you who are from Brooklyn, everybody called everything Flatbush. Well, it turns out I grew up in Crown Heights. Who knew? And the building that you see is where I grew up, 901 Washington Avenue, directly across the street from the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens, which I walked through every day on my way to junior high school and high school because I knew the secret entrance, because I took classes and I grew vegetables attempting to make monster vegetables by shoving corn seeds into things and seeing if we could create mutants. What a wonderful experience it was to walk through those gardens four seasons of the year, snow, autumn, spring, and summer. I was three blocks away from the Brooklyn Museum where they let us run through the halls shouting so we could hear the echoes and freaking out when we saw the sarcophaguses. But they didn't care, we were kids. And then the Brooklyn Grand Army Plaza, the main library of the Brooklyn uh, Library, where there was a kid's library, and what did we aspire to do? At age 12, they let you out into the entire library. Billions of books. There was nothing hidden from you. You could take any book you wanted out and read it. It was quite rich, and lower is the uh, Brooklyn Temple, Union Temple, which is still there to this day, where I went every Friday and every Saturday and every Sunday to Sunday school from the time I was nine years old to the time I left to go to college at 16. I had other collaborators. The first was Ian Fleming. I had the, the belief that you should read every single book by an author, but not necessarily in the order that the author wrote the book. 
And so Ian Fleming was a great mentor for me. I read James Bond and I realized I was James Bond. <laughs> and one Christmas day, my friend Manny, who went on to become a neurologist, told me a secret. He said, you know, on Christmas Day, all the Christians are in church. No one's in the movie theaters. Let's go. And we saw Dr. No. And you can see the resemblance. <laughs> and why I did not know what this was called, and only many years later found out what it was called, I realized theory of mind. Because James Bond, that is Sean Connery, looked exactly like the image of James Bond in my mind. It was frightening when his face came on the screen because that was exactly what I thought he looked like. And I realized what's in my mind, as weird as it might be, is in other people's minds as well. And that's an amazing, amazing thing that I'm not the only one who thinks this stuff. My other collaborator was James Fenimore Cooper, and I read every single book, again, not in the same order that he wrote them. And again, this opened my mind to an entire world, not just a world of literature, a world of beauty, a world of amazement contained in words. How beautiful words could be, and how wonderful it would be if one could write those words, which at the time I was not capable of doing. And my final mentor was Edgar Rice Burroughs. I never much cared for Tarzan, but I loved John Carter, a man suddenly whipped off the earth and deposited on Mars, which is pretty much how I felt. I felt I had been whipped off earth and deposited in Mars. That happened to be my family. But again, this was a man who was constantly coping with stress and saving people, and I thought, this is a good world. Now, at the time, even though I had decided to become a physician, my other thought was maybe I would become a gunfighter because the quick draw was very appealing and it seemed to solve an awful lot of problems on television. But instead, I decided to, to study music. And I played the guitar. And this is me at Camp Wellmet. Did anyone here go to Camp Wellmet? Every once in a while, I find someone, ah, thank goodness. And who else? It was a Jewish camp in the middle of nowhere. It was in Narrowsburg, New York, surrounded by thousands of acres of forest. And they just let us do whatever we wanted. You'd go out for a two-day expedition in the woods. Fine, come back when you're ready. Played music. There was nothing in the camp, by the way. I mean, the camp had nothing. It had a wooden backboard where you could hit tennis balls. That was it. And a lake. So everything you did came out of your imagination and came out of you hanging out with other people. We did a lot of playing folk music. I still have that guitar. Uh, it's a, it's a, a Gibson LG3. I have no idea what it's worth. My son sort of thinks he owns it. Uh, but wonderful guitar. And for those of you who play guitar, I got that guitar when I was 12. It has never had a fret job. This is my family at my bar mitzvah. Only two of us are alive. Uh, my father, if you remember that shadow, is the person standing next to me. My grandfather on the, on the other side. The, the guy next to my grandfather is Sal Petroselli, a teamster who converted to Judaism to marry my aunt, who then took on the name Petroselli and declared herself Italian. Uh, my mother is in the middle, surrounded by my father's sister and my grandmother, and my sister, Elise, who passed away, and my sister, Marcy, who's an engineer. That was my first bar mitzvah. So for those of you who've been bar mitzvahed, you should be thinking, what? My grandfather was modern Orthodox, and he did not think a reform bar mitzvah counted. And so the next week, I was bar mitzvahed a second time at his Orthodox shul in Brooklyn. I still don't know why I agreed to that, beyond that I loved my grandfather very much, and he made the best Shabbat tea of sweet tuchni, sugar, and lemon. No one has duplicated the recipe I have tried. <clears throat> then I went to high school. This is not a prison. This is Erasmus Hall High School on Flatbush Avenue. 
The center, in the center of this quad is the actual original high school founded in something like 1650 by the, by the Dutch who had settled that part of, of Brooklyn. I loved Erasmus Hall. My family had gone to Erasmus Hall for generations. And the most important part of Erasmus Hall was that I learned I liked to perform. Now, this comes as no shock to anyone here. I understand that. Came as a big shock to me and my family. My name is in there. I thought I starred in Sing. I was positive I starred in Sing. And I got in touch with one of my friends who I knew had the brochure. And he said, I think you were in Sing, Phil. Yeah, your name's there. I'm pretty sure I starred in Sing. And we won. Sing was a competition, for those of you who remember. And we won both junior and singer, senior Sing. And I got a scholarship. And I got a region scholarship. It meant basically you take in the regents and pass the regents, and it was a $500 scholarship. Why does that figure prominently? Well, I had decided I would apply to four colleges, and if I didn't get into those colleges, I wasn't going to college. I applied to University of California at Berkeley. I applied to McGill. I have no idea why I applied to McGill. I applied to Rensselaer. That was a terrible mistake. And I forget the other one I applied to, some other place very far away. I got into Berkeley, but they didn't give me money, and my mother said, you can't go to California. And during the process, my guidance counselor said, McGill, you're gonna go to Canada? Go to Cornell. You'll get a region scholarship, and the tuition at Cornell was $500 to be an Aggie. So I applied to Cornell, and I got into Cornell, and that covered my tuition. And on my first day at Cornell, I had been there once in the summer, don't go to Cornell in the summer, because the weather's nice. Right? The weather stays nice for about two weeks. But on my first day, I got together with my advisor, R.W. Holly. R.W. Holly went on to win the Nobel Prize. That was very fortunate for me, because in his house, we were talking, I was a biochemistry major, we are talking about being a, a biochemistry major, and I said, you know, when do I get to take literature and art history and writing? And he said, no. All of your arts and sciences courses will be calculus, PCAM, organic. I said, I hate that stuff. And he said, then you're not a biochemist. He left the next week to go to Caltech to finish the research to win his Nobel Prize and assigned us to some other guy whose name I don't remember. And I met with him and he said, you know, Phil, you don't have to declare a major for two years. Do anything you want. We have a lot of things in the ag school that you would like. So I went to animal husbandry, and there we are. For those of you who know Cornell, we went to the barns, and as we're walking through the barns, one of the people right in front of me's foot disappeared in a pound of manure. And I said, okay, this is not for me. I tried a few other things. I, I, I tried etymology. I really don't like bugs. And so at the end of the two years, I said to him, can I transfer to arts and sciences? He said, sure. You basically just transfer to arts and sciences. I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, this went the wrong way because I pressed the wrong button. The uh, sad part about transferring to arts and sciences at Cornell is they ask for back tuition. And they conclude that you should have been paying full tuition at arts and sciences, not the state-supported school. And they asked me for $2,100. Now, today, $2,100 is nothing. In 1966, 67, $2,100 was an immense amount of money, and I had no money. I had this ne'er-do-well father. So I went to my fraternity brothers and said, I need $2,100. Now you'll find out that I could. <sighs> and they took money out of their pockets and gave me $2,100, and I wrote down efficiently. It took me two years to pay it off. Not one person ever asked me for a penny. And I paid off person by person by person until I had paid off that debt. No one even mentioned it. Unfortunately, I was really not that smart in college. And what I mean is, I wasn't dumb, but I took things that were interesting. So I took Russian. I've studied several languages. I speak none. <laughs> Russian was a six-credit course. I got a C. Calculus was a six-credit course. I got a C. What does that do to your grade point average? It's impossible to recover. So when I transferred to arts and sciences, I asked to take French, but I'd studied French in high school, and I said, 
really doesn't matter because I can't speak any languages. And they made me take an exam. They said, you could take French. And I took French from a linguist, not a French teacher. And he made it fascinating. And what did we read? We read stupid mystery novels. And I got A's. And I took art history. And I got A's. I took political science, and I got A's. It was great. Finally, I was doing something I enjoyed. But it was during the Vietnam War. And if you, you know, didn't get an exemption, you got drafted. But I had a secret weapon that no one knew about. I knew I was 4F. And I knew there was no way, even if I got drafted, I got a very low number, a very low number. For those of you who are old enough to know what that means, that was a very frightening thing, except I would have gone if I could have. That was my head at the time. It had nothing to do with country, just had to do with being in the military. But I decided instead, after I had my physical and I was uh, declared 4F, that I would go to graduate school because there was a lot of unrest at the time and I thought, this might be a better place for me. I actually knew all these people at Cornell. For those of you who remember the riots in 68 and 69, these were all my friends. I joined SDS for one reason and one reason only. In the middle of the night, they would get together and decide, let's blow up a building. And I would go and I would say, these are such beautiful buildings. Why do we want to blow them up? Why don't we just protest instead? That'll accomplish a lot more than blowing up a building. And we would vote, because it was Students for a Democratic Society, right? And we'd vote, and we'd vote down bloating up the building, and we, we would take over a building. And of course, we did take over the ROTC building. And uh, you know, we were surrounded by police for several weeks. It made for a lot of fun in my senior year. This is my first piece of writing. You can't see it. That's on purpose. It is essentially somatoform disorder. It is about someone who has a medical illness of which he thinks he's going to die, related to a relationship that he's in. It's a 30-page novella. My friends loved it, and they said, wow, you should be a psychiatrist. This is me at graduation, and this is me when I decided to clean my act up. So this is me, the dapper Phil, and this is me, the graduate Phil. And this top hat and uh, tuxedo fi figures very prominently. I literally found them on the street and had them cleaned. We'll come back to them in a minute. I went to graduate school. So I went to the New School for Social Research in the heart of the village, and I met this incredible woman, Arian Mack. Arian Mack was actually married to a famous novelist, Irving Howe, and she was my mentor. And she said, I need a research assistant. I had done some research in, in college on visual perception. She was a perception guru. She gave me a laboratory and said, go to town. And I studied depth perception for about a year and said to her, in those days you called people by their first names, even though she was a full professor, what are we going to do with this when we're done? And she said, what does that mean? I said, well, I spend it an entire year in a dark room studying depth perception, which turns out is not innate in humans. In fact, it's not innate in any mammal. You have to learn depth perception. But once you learn it, you cannot change it. Unlike for those of you who know the visual ex per perception experiences where you put in a, um, um, a prism and you can change left, right, you cannot change depth. I gave a lot of people headaches. And I said to her, well, this is just about knowledge, but that's not good enough. It doesn't help anybody. It just helps our understanding. It doesn't help humans who have problems. And so I said, you know what? I'd like to apply to medical school just to see if I could get in. What do you think? She said, sure. She wrote me a great letter. I was a straight A student in graduate school. Something had changed for me. And I got into New York Medical College. And I went back to her and said, I got to go. She said, but wait, you're my research assistant. You spent a year, you get nothing from it. And I said, well, talking about getting nothing from it, how about you go to the dean and ask the dean to give me a master's degree because I have spent a year and I have written a thesis and you love me, right? And she did it. And the dean, Joe Greenberg, said, Phil, I'm going to give you a master's degree. Never come back. <laughs> and something changed. So I went through years. I mean, I'm a smart person the smartest, but smart, but I'd never performed well until graduate school, and then I became super Phil. 
So you can't really see the top hat is actually on my head. And something happened to me in medical school that I truly cannot explain to you. Because in medical school, though I worked mostly out of horrifying anxiety that I would kill somebody and not know enough, I performed at the top level I could. In those days, I think it's still true, they would post the grades with your social security number. So only you knew what you got. And if I wasn't in one or two, I, I was crazy. Somebody asked me once, do you study a lot? I said, I don't study hardly at all. She said, well, tell me what you do. I said, well, every night I read all of my notes from the beginning of the semester to where we are. And then later I reread the textbook from the beginning to where we are. But then I always read the next chapter so that I'm ahead. And she said to me, and you say you don't study? I said, that's studying? Who knew? And quite by accident, as a second year medical student, I had a, a NIMH summer fellowship. I don't know why they called it that. You didn't get any money. I was at Metropolitan Hospital hanging out with the psych residents, and I went to a hypnosis class. It was not by Dr. Spiegel. And I saw the chief resident in psychiatry, and chief residents are the same everywhere, let's face it, who was a grade five. And he was age regressed in front of the group. I thought this was the most amazing thing I ever saw, and I asked the instructor, would he train me in hypnosis? The single psychiatric thing that runs through my entire career, and I have practiced and taught hypnosis for 50 years, very close to. But the other thing I did during medical school was I decided to study martial arts. Now I'm disabled, and I'm officially disabled. I have one of those old things I hang from my car window when I can't find parking. And I studied in the village with a guy named Peter Urban, who was a legend in martial arts. He was a guy who studied everybody's style and then went to the dojo and beat everybody up. It was full contact karate. And after about a year of studying full contact karate, I said, okay, this is not for me. And I went to the 92nd Street Y where I met Grandmaster Robert J. Cooper. Robert J. Cooper looked like a homeless person. He was a junior high school teacher. He was the best father I ever had. And he taught me martial arts. And he, he introduced me to Duck Sung Sun, one of the great Korean martial artists. And I spent the next 30 years studying martial arts. And it took me a lot of places. And it took me into the most important place I've ever been, which is the ring because the shortest or longest two minutes of your life is when you're in the ring, because it's the real deal. You don't know that person, he or she doesn't know you, and there's only one thing both of you want, to survive. And so I did competitive martial arts for the next several decades, and towards the end of medical school, now being AOA, I wrote my first paper. It's on countertransference. It quotes McKinnon and Michaels. I went on to obviously know both McKinnon and Michaels quite well. And my wife read it and she said, you know, it sounds like you. And it's not a bad paper. And because I was going into psychiatry and I also still didn't have any money, my sister arranged with her best friend, my future wife's sister, for me to stay in her apartment in Brookline, across the street from where Bob Bolin lives. 100 Longwood Avenue. And so I arranged to stay at her apartment while I was interviewing at Mass Mental Health, and she buzzed me in, and I looked up the four stories, and I said, I'm going to marry that woman. And I had fallen completely in love. I, to this day, cannot explain it to you, but I knew I was going to marry her. And luck have it, there was a snowstorm, so I couldn't go back and stayed an extra night, and we talked. And I was involved with someone, and she said, you got to get out of that relationship, and I would love for us to have a relationship. And so I did. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So I did go into psychiatry. I didn't go to mass mental health. I went to Columbia, because someone said, that's where gentlemen go. <laughs> and I remind you of that top hat picture. So I went to Columbia, where I met Ed Sacker, Don Klein, Fred Quicken, and Art Rifkin. All of blessed memory, sadly. All people who, you walked in their office and they said, okay, let's talk, what do you want to do? That's a good idea, that's a bad idea. I went to Art Rifkin, I wanted to study pancreatic cancer. 
and he said, you don't know enough to study pancreatic cancer, which was a little disheartening. He said, nobody knows enough to study pancreatic cancer. We don't understand why people are depressed from pancreatic cancer. We don't have the science to understand that today. But we're doing a project. Would you like to join our project? I said, sure, what's the project? We're going to study panic disorder. We're going to make people panic by infusing them with sodium lactate. And we need somebody who's willing to do the psychotherapy and psychopharmacology. We're going to do an open label study of dizipramine, which had never been used in panic disorder. And I hung out with these guys for the next many, many years. And they really mentored me. And so I wrote my first paper, which was accepted without revision. And Don Klein said to me, Phil, enjoy it. It will never happen again. <laughs> Prescient, I must say. And so towards the end of my residency, my, one of my close friends said, get your black belt now, Phil, because once you get married, that's it. You're never going to have time. And this is actually from my second degree black belt competition. That's me performing kata, and that's me breaking four inches of wood. Uh, and getting my second degree, I got a second degree, first and second in Taekwondo, and a first degree black belt in Jiu-Jitsu. And it was the core of my life. When I was an intern, I missed therapy much more than I missed dojo. If I had a choice, I went to the dojo. And it was a core of my life until, unfortunately, I got, I got injured. And in May of that year, I got my black belt, and in September, I got married. I'm not showing the picture of me because it's too hilarious. I'm wearing a peach uh, tuxedo. <laughs> I don't know what, what I was thinking. Right? And we got married. And we were married about 10 years, and then we had Matthew. And I remember when Maureen took this picture and I looked at it and I said, why would a gene code for this? Right? We only have 30,000 genes. Why does a gene code for the exact same behavior? between two people. But he was the cutest kid imaginable, as you can see, the sweetest boy. And around the exact same time, I wrote a movie. And it was called Three Faces of AIDS. And you know where it premiered? Here. It premiered in the New Orleans meeting of the Academy. And I couldn't watch it, so Jeff Hammer, for some of you may remember, and I walked around New Orleans while people watched this. And Jimmy Holland, one of my greatest collaborators, said, well, you have to show it at Memorial. And so I went down with my VHS cassette, and I showed it at Memorial, and there was a resident there, Carol Walter. Uh, and Carol and I have been, I would like to think, close friends since 1989. And one day, Carol said to me, we can't get any money from the drug companies to support fellowships in the academy because we're a 501c6 organization. We have to form a foundation. And so we formed the foundation. Much blood, sweat, and tears went into that. And it, here it is today, a robust collaboration between us and the world of philanthropy. And it supports so many fabulous things just by the chance encounter of meeting Carol in Jimmy's office. And then APA. So literally at the same time when my son was born and I started this, Herb Partis called me up and said, hey, Phil, would you be my local arrangements chair for the 1990 meeting of the APA? And I said, uh, can I get back to you? So I called people and they said, you cannot say no. So what do you mean I cannot say no? He said, you cannot say no. And so I became involved in the APA, and I'm still involved in the APA, having many mentors, some of you who know. But Bob Hales was the best, because Bob Hales and I became good friends, and I would complain to Bob, and when I complained to Bob, he would give me work. Because never complain to a military person if you don't plan to do the work. And that is how I got to meet all these people. And you will now see people again and again and again who have become my collaborators year after year after year. And some of them have not only been collaborators, but they have been extremely nurturant and have mothered me over many years. And right below Michelle is my son, now grown up, who I think looks much better than Tom Cruise, but much like Tom Cruise. And you meet very interesting people at the APA, because you have a lot of fun planning things. 
But then there are my friends who just like to hang with me. And you see who you are. We smoke a lot of cigars. And some people appear again and again and again. I appear in various stages of hair or no hair. And we have a good time. And we collaborate. But I don't call it collaboration. I call it friendship. And then there's Dan Winstead. And there is no more devilish person on earth than Dan and Jenny Winstead. Dan, Jenny has passed away. Because Dan asked me to be his vice chair for the 1998 meeting of APA and his program chair for the 1999 meeting of the Academy. And that really launched a different career for me at APA, now moving into being chair and really taking over the meeting. And then there's Laura Roberts, who as a resident said, hey, Phil, we should study assisted suicide. I said, there's no such thing as assisted suicide. She said, yeah, there is. And John Hayes, who some of you may recognize, and got up every morning at our meeting and said, you've got to fill out Phil's survey. Fill it out. And we published this paper on what we think about assisted suicide. And we were, by the way, cowards. You know, we didn't want anything to do with it. And that led to people asking me about my thoughts. And it led to probably the most important paper I've ever published, was how to look at assisted suicide in a psychodynamic way. A two-year effort on, on my part and writing. And then there's writing. And Don Kornfeld said, you want to write a chapter on anxiety in this book? I said, sure. And then Sandy Glassman and I wrote a chapter. And Sandy Glassman, really one of the great psychopharmacologists in our era, taught me how to write. He brutalized things, but he taught me how to write. And he said, you have the skills, you just don't use them. And each of these books has been an opportunity to collaborate with someone else. And some of these people you won't know, some of these are social workers. Dick and Pat, Dick and Pat as you know, Dick, Dick Brown and Pat Grubarg became my collaborators with the book for American Psychiatric Press. And then Oprah one day said, hey, you want to write a video? And I've always wanted to do videos. So we did a training video on the PANS. If anyone would like it, I'd be happy to send it to you. And then each of these books, again, a collaboration. I haven't seen Rob. I don't know if he's here. But collaboration is just working with your friends and being supported. And then one of us is the lady. That's obvious. And it's pretty obvious one of us is the tramp. And as Kitty mentioned, that led to us coming up with a brand new idea, doing CL psychiatry, but actually having people enjoy us doing CL psychiatry, which led to the publication in the Wall Street Journal. And then each of these study guides has just come from the fun of working with people I like. And the new textbook, which is not out yet, with Paul, you can pre-order it. It's again an opportunity to collaborate with people you really love. And then there's hypnosis. And hypnosis, as I said, has been the strongest psychiatric thing I've ever done. And I'm just about to do my first grant of my entire career as a hypnotist studying how hypnosis affects mindfulness and putting people in the scanner and seeing what lights up, which is great fun. And then there are my friends with whom I sit and I drink and I joke, and I would not go to meetings if it wasn't for my friends. Many friends. Many friends. And friends whose children, I remember as children, are now on the program committee and friends who have great parties. And Uma, I hope Uma is here, who I met accidentally, and is now beyond, the, she's a Cordon Bleu chef, she's a psychiatrist, we collaborate on things, it's all fun. And the great gifts that one gets, the gifts of love, the gift I look at every day in my office, but I only kept it in a box for five years because I was afraid it would fall and break. And then I hit the wall. And what does that mean? Polio came back. And I realized with post-polio syndrome, I was losing muscle and that there was nothing one could do about it. And I just had to change my lifestyle. And not everything is good. And this is a true comment that was said to me some years ago, probably the scariest words ever said to me. On the surface, they look good. And I realized one should expect the unexpected and be prepared. And at the time, I thought there was no exit for me, and it was the end of the road. But then I realized that maybe not. That's it, exactly. You know, Counselor, 
Recently, I'd become very much aware that there were fewer days ahead than there are behind. But I took some comfort from the fact that the, the family would go on. That's it exactly. And so it did. And so, 13 months ago, we were blessed with Cece. And the family does go on. She was cute then. She's cuter. She's even cuter. And for those of you who have grandchildren or will, there is no better thing on earth. Who knew that she was going to become a therapist? <laughs> she has the look. At less than a year, she has the look. My God. And the family does go on. I know you showed this picture. So I've had two families. My colleagues, who I think are my family, and I hope they see me as my family, and then my blood family. This is the fortune from the fortune cookie, the evening I got the letter of this award. I am not making that up. So these have been my mentors. You will recognize many of them. You won't recognize them all. They are mostly men of action and the greatest psychoanalyst I've ever known, not my own analyst, Ethel Person, who was a superb, supportive, nurturant mentor throughout the time that I knew her before she passed away. And so, in conclusion, to quote, what I am and that's all what I am, I fly like a sailor man. I am what I am. And so I would like to end in my own words. The concept of forgiveness as experts seeing benefits. I'm Stefan Kaufman. Studies show the ability to forgive has benefits for those who do and fallout for those who don't. Dr. Philip Muskin at Columbia University Medical Center says failing to forgive brings on harmful stress. It increases hormonal production, increases a variety of different inflammatory markers, as if we were responding to a danger. For those who forgive, the benefits include improved cholesterol levels and sleep, a reduced risk of heart attack and lowered blood pressure. Stephen Kaufman, CBS News. There is really no way to thank you for this honor, and I've thought about it at great length, and so I've decided to ask the great expert at self-expression to do it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Muskin one more time. <laughs>